Sanders, uh, CEO of Gen Impact. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, host this panel together uh, with four other great and um, uh, uh, rising stars within the investing community. Uh, so tonight we have uh, Paul Briscoe. Uh, Paul, just uh, wave your hand so everyone knows. Uh, Hello. Michael and Dario. Hi, everyone. That. Uh, but Divina Schrotz. Hey, everyone. And Anna the Panda Boss. Hi. Okay, uh, so we'll start with a, a very uh, a basic background question, if I may, uh, and then we'll go through uh, some of the uh, some of the questions asked by the attendees. Uh, so first of all, if you would like to just give a brief introduction about yourself, um, how long you've been investing, and also a very generic uh, introduction about your investment style, such as you only look at dividend stocks, you like uh, short-term trading, if that's you, um, anything that you feel like uh, mentioning about um, uh, the particular styles or the methodologies that you follow as an everyday investor. Should we start with Paul, please? Hi, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm just trying to sort out the YouTube thing. Um, my name's Paul. Uh, I haven't been very uh, investing very long. Um, and... Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> Sorry, I was just messing with something. You caught me off guard there. <laughs> uh, come back to me, Shaq. You're okay. right to come back to me. <laughs> right. Uh, Anna? Hi. Uh, so I'm Anna. Um, I'm an accountant uh, by profession. And I've been investing just over a year. So I think it's been like a year and three months or something. Uh, so not very long either. Uh, I'm sort of more geared towards the dividend investing but I still hold companies that don't pay dividends just for the kind of growth and long-term um, aspects I, I didn't want to have like the fear of missing out so I have probably about 25 percent of my portfolio in the non-dividend stocks and the rest on on the dividends um, I think that was everything was there anything else no thank you nope. uh, but yeah my, my name is uh, Bert Bert in the Netherlands <laughs> I started the Netherlands. Uh, I started investing uh, like three years ago, which for me uh, felt a little late since I've been studying uh, economics and business economics and I'm a business economics and economics teacher in uh, high school. So for me, it felt kind of late, but um, yeah, in the beginning, I started investing in dividend paying stocks and um, yeah, more of lately, I'm also looking in uh, stocks that don't pay a dividend. And for example, I'm also, I'm also looking at uh, small cap uh, companies, which got my interest like uh, two months ago. So I, I'm interested in a lot of things. And you can also see that in my investing style. I do not have one style in particular. I started with dividends, but now I'm doing different things. So that's basically a brief introduction about my investing style. Thank you. Uh, finally, Dario. Hi, hi everyone. So my name is uh, Dario. Uh, so I've been investing now for about 10 years. Um, makes me feel old. <laughs> um, I started with the uh, the Humble Index Fund um, and uh, it sort of stayed that way for about a year, really, uh, back when I started, just when I sort of, um, that's when I decided to try and um, learn a bit more about the process. And over time, I slowly branched out. So I don't have any particular investing style. Um, there's a portion of my um, investments are in the plain and uh, powerful index fund, but another portion um, is about 50-50 split uh, in stocks as well. Um, those stocks in particular uh, don't really follow a sort of a set theme. Um, I have some growth stocks, have some dividend stocks. Um, a bit like Bert, I quite like my small caps as well, um, but in the right proportions, uh, not too big a overall part of my portfolio but I do like some exposure to those uh, and uh, I'm very much an international investor so I like to invest in all regions around the world because I don't really want to miss out on any particular areas. Okay thank you sorry I missed you out Paul back to you. Yeah. Yes um, so yes I haven't been investing very very long um, mainly started out with sort of dividend stocks particularly ones that grow their dividend mostly uh, and possibly some that are just at the end of their exponential growth cycle. So we're still starting to get them at the early phase in their dividend growth, trying not to fall for those value traps and the decay and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I do think of dividends as really an easy way of me 
picking certain stocks, but it's very hard to go, oh, you're this type of investor. So so sort of value, um, try to look at more value. Uh, and I'm mainly not in growth because I don't understand it. I, I just don't feel like I understand how to see a total addressable market and things like that. Okay, right, thank you. Uh, so a very quick follow-up question on that, which is if you look at your portfolio today, what is the rough um, diversification in terms of country, um, different types of securities, large caps, small caps, uh, different types of companies or ETFs, um, um, if you invest not just in single stocks, but also gain exposure through some ETFs. Um, yeah, so just look at your portfolio today. What is the rough uh, percentage split amongst all these categories? Um, Anna? It's a tough question. Um, I think at the moment, um, it's a little bit more geared towards individual stocks than I'd like. Um, it's mostly been because I felt like there's been this big sale on stocks. So I've invested more into the individual companies whilst they've been sort of undervalued. The goal is to have more like 60% in ETFs, 40% um, individual stocks. But at the moment, I think it's the other way around. Um, <laughs> I'm mostly invested in just UK and America. Um, I've got a couple others, um, but that's that's pretty much it. I've not really looked into expanding beyond that. Um, and then in terms of what I have, it's mostly just, again, stocks, ETFs, um, and a couple of cryptocurrencies now, but that's it. Um, again, bonds I want to look into, but at the moment, it's not a priority. Okay. Uh, how about we go to Bert? Yeah. Um, last year, I bought a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies. So basically, I only do individual stocks. I, I don't buy any ETFs. Um, but last year, uh, when the coronavirus uh, pandemic started, I started to look at pharmaceutical companies because I thought that would be a safe haven. So I have quite a portion of that. Uh, I have some semiconductor companies and mainly uh, Dutch companies like ASML, uh, ASM International, uh, they is semiconductor industries, these uh, companies, which have been doing well. Um, and uh, I also hold some other companies like one a small cap token energy I bought like two weeks ago and so it already doubled. So that's kind of a lucky thing. And I know that's a lot of risk I'm taking, but um, yeah, those are the things that interest me because I'm always looking at co company presentations, company websites, the news. And that's the reason I buy individual stocks because it's also kind of a hobby to keep track of uh, the companies I'm a shareholder of. So in terms of international, um, let's see, I started off with a lot of uh, US uh, stocks, but as of lately, I've been buying more companies in uh, Europe, also because the dollar was uh, weakening. So mm -hmm. I it might be good to have some diversification also in terms of uh, currency I'm, uh, I'm using. Sounds like a busy man. Yeah. Uh, Paul? Uh, mostly US. Um, it's just where it's at at the minute. Uh, I have probably two or three European stocks, but the high dividend withdrawal tax in places like Switzerland and things like that um, it's about 30% still. So I kind of worry about that, but that's what puts me off, uh, European stocks, stocks like Volkswagen, love to be in Volkswagen, but, um, yeah, 30% dividend withholding tax on that one. Um, and then the rest is UK and I'm actually relative. I, I think there's some gems in the FTSE 100 that are capable of doing something, but in general, the UK FTSE 100 is a bit of a dead zone at the minute, I think. Uh, so, yeah, majority US, a little bit of Europe, a little bit of UK. That's kind of it. Is it all stocks or any ETFs in there? So it, it's, it's mostly stocks, probably 90% stocks. Um, S&P 500, I have just to track my progress against the S&P 500, which is quite funny. And um, But I'm putting a lot into VFEM at the minute, um, emerging markets, uh, the Vanguard emerging markets, because I don't, Obviously, I don't know what's going over in India, China, or uh, Brazil, all of that sort of stuff. So uh, I do think emerging markets have got something coming, and I'm trying to load a bit higher in that, a uh, bit more into that at the minute. Okay. And finally, Dario? 
Yes. Um, so, um, so 50, 50, um, roughly, um, so funds and, uh, individual stocks, uh, of those funds, um, it's uh, a lot of regions around the world. So UK, um, I don't have main exposure to the FTSE 100 in the UK. I've got, um, my main UK exposure is the FTSE 250. Um, I think there's a bit of, um, a, room for, a bit more room for growth there and, uh, the, the 100's chronically underperformed for a long time now. So I'm trying, I'm trying to avoid that. Um, I've got exposure to um, the Asia Pacific region, uh, China, emerging markets, and the US all across my funds. Uh, and individual stocks um, split between uh, some uh, mid caps, uh, small caps. So um, uh, some smaller speculative companies, um, I'm hoping that will sort of disrupt the industry uh, over the next few years. Um, but in, in all sorts of regions of the world, really. So uh, in the US, um, the UK, uh, China, uh, and also emerging markets as well. So, Okay, fantastic. Um, so we'll talk about some of the specific um, stocks or areas that you're looking at. But before we get to that, one thing I do want to ask is, if you look back to your past um, for, for, for some, you know, a few years of experience uh, for, for Dario 10, um, how, as a, as a new investor, what would you suggest to them in terms of uh, getting new ideas? Where do you get the new ideas from? And what, what kind of due diligence and research that you put in to each stock or each, um, um, each potential security that you're looking to, to buy and um, for the research on? Uh, should we start with um, Bert on this question? Yeah, of course. So where do I get the information from? Um, yeah, basically a lot of things. Um, I started off by uh, using Seeking Alpha a few years ago. Uh, I uh, made a portfolio, which also showed the news on every uh, company. But I can now use, of course, uh, Genuine Impact for that also. <laughs> so that's one way to keep track of the companies uh, I'm looking at. And then I basically just look at the news, uh, watch TV channels that uh, cover the stock market. Uh, I go on YouTube. Uh, also Instagram, and if I see something interesting, then I will just search it on Google, and we'll read, we'll, uh, read up on the on the company. And I will also go to the company website to look at uh, corporate presentation, and also look at earnings reports. These kind of things, maybe interviews on YouTube with uh, with the management team of the company to get an idea of what what they are doing, and that's my way to um, get. Um, an initial view of the company. And after that, I will, of course, uh, delve more into depth, like the financials, uh, etc. But to get a rough view about it, I uh, just use all kinds of channels on the on the internet. Okay. okay. How about how you? About... Sorry, was that me? Because it broke off a little bit. Yes. How about you? Anna? Yeah. Right. Um, so for me, it's a little bit of everything. And it's, I think, something that I've learned over the last year is not to focus just on any individual financials because it's the big picture that matters. So oh, yeah. I try to look at sort of all the different sources. So um, I quite like Simply Wall Street, uh, Genuine Impact, um, the news as well. Um, <laughs> um, also like the investing apps that I use and stuff, they also have little bits of like analyst ratings and stuff, what analysts think and um, just sort of looking at the picture overall, um, what everyone's thinking, is it what I'm thinking and um, sourcing it from that way. But I also try to invest in companies that I really believe in long term to try and stop myself from having to constantly check on what's happening with the company. Um, so as an example, like Johnson & Johnson um, is one of my biggest holdings and I feel like they're a company that's been through so much there's been so many issues with their history and they've survived it and they're thriving so it's not necessarily one that I feel the need to constantly check how they're doing so I try to focus on on companies like that okay uh, Paul how about you um very it's very very similar to Anna there because um the the style and of value and of ex especially the dividend investment thing is to essentially create some sort of indexy type fund where you don't have to look at you you are picking somewhere in the top 50 top 100 companies and you're just hoping that they kind of last forever so that that was initially part of my was part of my strategy uh, now however it's a lot more about 
finding when you're trying to find those different stocks when you're trying to find those value stocks i'm tending to go to what people trust and uh Everyone sort of covered everything there. Seeking Alpha was very good. Um, and but I think there's a big paywall behind that at the moment. <laughs> so, and they had a lot of investor insight, but also Twitter, you're picking um, people yeah. that you trust on Twitter, p- picking people who you think have the sort of right, right ideas. I mean, me personally, I'm not, not going for them SPACs and, <laughs> you know, all the hype and stuff, but I'm finding like people like, Prof G and uh, Brian Feraldi's, all that sort of stuff. They seem to be people that I would trust. And then it's then it's for me to go out there, uh, go to Seeking Alpha, go to Genuine Impact, go to uh, Morningstar, look at the revenues, top line revenue, bottom line, um, bottom line earnings, and then go from there, figure out what's going on with the company. I do delve very, very far into a company before I buy it. Um, and again, same, same with Anna, uh, same with Anna, you've got the quantitative, qualitative and out qualitative analysis. You want to see both. You want to see the financials and you want to see the narrative. You want to see the story and, uh, you've got to just find lots of different sources that you trust for that. Mm-hmm. Dario. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, genuine impact, obviously. Um, the, um, the, the other resources, um, that I use at Yahoo finance, uh, is great just for a sort of, um, is it very broad overview of all sorts of different, um, market news, uh, MSN money, um, seeking alpha like Paul and, um, uh, Anna mentioned, um, guru focus. I like, um, I really, I think guru focus has got a really good one pager in terms of the fundamentals of a company. Um, it's a bit overwhelming, but, um, all the info is there. If you just want to scan at certain key elements, um, a particular website I really like is proactive investors. Um, and they, that is really good for small cap stocks. And, um, I think, um, I think that's got some, um, a really good coverage of some areas that you don't necessarily see in some of the mainstream media. So that can be a good to, uh, tool to use. Um, the, the, um, uh, the other, the other one. So, uh, market watch, um, uh, CSI markets as well, uh, because I find that it's got good industry benchmarks. So when you're looking at the fundamentals of a company, uh, it's quite a good sort of cross reference to say, well, at the average of the industry is this, what's my company doing? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it, for me, it varies in sort of terms of how much, how much money that I'm, I'm, I'm investing. If, um, it, you, I'll always do more due, dil- due diligence if I'm investing a greater amount of money than if, um, if it's a smaller sort of more speculative venture. Um, but uh, ultimately it, it's got to just sort of, it's a balance between time spent researching and how much risk you're willing to take with your investments. Yeah. Well, you, 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 it's, it's, it's very interesting that you mentioned this is actually my next question, um, which is, it, it may be a bit uh, psychological or even philosophical, when you look at a company, at what point do you say, okay, this is enough um, confidence I can get from my research versus, oh, I still need to do more. Um, how do you balance between time spent versus actually just pulling the trigger? Uh, is there anything that I can share with our audience? Because could, many people want to do this, but they don't really know what they don't know until they do. So anything you'd like to uh, chip in on that? Uh, in just in terms of where where do you where where do you kind of mark as a conclusion point uh, along your research process on any particular companies? This is an open end question. Any take on that? Well, I have largely just done it at the point where I feel comfortable, and I suppose for a lot of people, that's where it's got to be at the moment. Um, we're trying. I've been speaking to a few people. We're trying to develop some models where we can follow it all the way to the point, and. I, it's, this is very early stage that we're in at the minute, but I'm trying to figure out it, the same, the answer to the same question that you're asking there is how far do we go? And at what point can you just stop? And for me, I'm learning about growth stocks at the minute. I'm really trying to figure it out. I'm really trying to get myself confident enough to really want to go, okay, this is how a growth stock works. You know, this is the total addressable market. There's nothing better out there that I, that I would rather put my money in. And we're trying to create a flow chart for that at the moment. Um, Still working on it though. <laughs> Anyone else? I, I think it's sort of, um, I really struggled with this when I started because I'd spend weeks researching things and I wasn't doing anything. I was just looking at all of these companies and all of these different investments and just not actually taking any action. So I, I started trying to set a deadline and uh, basically these days now, if, 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 so, if so much time has passed and if I'm having to convince myself so hard 
that this company is a good investment, then it's not a good investment. That's the sort of approach that I take these days. If I'm having to convince, you know, it, it, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but if, if, if the story isn't there when you're looking through it to start with and you're having to pile all of this information together and really make a very robust investment case, then it, it's almost too difficult then to, to say, well, this is the, the, the right investment for me. And that's a, the sort of point where I just draw a line under it and move on. Yeah. Uh, paralysis by analysis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> paralysis by analysis. Yeah. If, if I can uh, talk about my case, um, I oftentimes do not spend too much time um, before pulling the trigger because I have quite a long-term view. Uh, I have like, I'm, I'm 29 years old, so I have more than 30 years to fill retirement. So when I buy a stock, I don't care too much about uh, the short-term news and all the other things happening. I'm just looking into like 20 or 30 years into, into the future and asking myself the question, uh, what will this company be like um, right then? And oftentimes, I'm answering that question for myself and I think it would be the company will be fine. So it will be fine to put my money into it right now. So that's kind of the, the thing that always pull, pulls the trigger for me, just looking into the future. Yeah, I would I would agree with that as well. For me, um, it's a very long term view. Um, I'm 28, so <laughs> um, a similar kind of approach. And I think I have a little bit of an unfair advantage in terms of because I'm a chartered accountant. I spent many years sort of learning about reading financial statements and things. So I almost have like a, an ability to know when I look at it, um, what's, what's going on. Um, not to say that that's all I do, obviously, but I think that helps just that gut feeling of like, is this company going to be good? Um, and then another part is a very tiny part of my portfolio. Um, and obviously you have to be comfortable with the risk of doing something like this. So just a little disclaimer here, um, but just investing in the companies that I really just believe in. Like there are ones where I wouldn't even look like Greg's for me is a great example. I just wanted to invest in Greg's. I mean, I put in like 30 or 40 pounds anyway. So it's like a tiny amount, but because I believed in them so much as a company and I wanted to almost want them to do well and they've been around for so long. Um, I just put the money in thinking they're going to be doing amazing for a long time. Um, so that's kind of a very small, small part of just like having a little bit of fun um, with investing as well. Yeah, I, that, that naturally leads to my next question. And before I ask just a bit of a legal disclaimer, this, uh, this panelist discussion is only used as reference. You need to all do your own research before you buy and sell securities. Uh, well, I, I have to say this just uh, just because we're talking about we're going to talk about individual companies or mention uh, individual company names. Um, looking at your portfolio today, uh, folks, um, if you if you let's say you sleep for the next sixty days or even you know three months, uh, what companies that you feel the most comfortable with holding, um, given the research you've done, given how much you know about these companies, any any top holdings that you feel like. Uh, um, throwing out there to to receive critique or even uh, cynical opinions on um, any any take on that one. Uh, I, I'd say for me JD.com. Okay. So yeah, I think. How about, um, we, do, how about we do three? By the way, how about we do, we do three in total, so so that we can kind of uh, sp spread out the risk a bit here. So JD.com from you, Dario. Yeah. That's one. How many holdings do you have, Dario? Just out of interest. Um, I've got in about. I've got about. Um, it's 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 up to. I've upped it recently, but it's split across a few um, different brokers for legacy reasons. So some some of my funds are with Hargreave Lansdowne. Um, a lot of my individual stocks are in split across the Gira and Trading Two One Two. It's 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 probably about um, twenty five ish now individual oh. holdings. Um, so let's go with top three. Um, so yeah, I would say uh, JD.com. Um, there's a, a speculative stock um, that I am expecting big things from, and I've put um, a bit about it on my stories in the past, which is called Eurasia Mining. Uh, so they're a Palladium miner um, based in uh, the tundra. And uh, ooh, what, what would my third be? Um, it's hard to think without my portfolio in front of me. <laughs> Buy, buy and hold. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay, so two, two from Dario. Um, who else wants to go? 
Okay. All right. I'll do it. Um, number one, Disney. Let's go for it. Disney. Nice. Uh, if you have to make a call, Disney's got to be the one at the minute, hasn't it? It's um, it's completely. I I try to talk about the corporate life cycle as much as I can, and Disney was largely coming to that decay area of its corporate life cycle. And now it might be in a reinvention phase and it might be now being able to monetize much more content. Uh, so there's, there's no reason why I can't see Disney carrying on for a long, long time, uh, streaming services, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, number two, uh, uh, it'd be controversial to say JP Morgan, I think. Um, okay. I think JP Morgan is the one bank that is trying its best to fend off the fintech revolution. And I think it's the one that's most capable of doing that at the moment. And last, oh, let's, let's just pick a UK one. Um, either BAE or legal in general. Legal in general has got to be the one that's got such a backup of funds. Uh, I, I still, even to this day, feel bad because I can't fully assess what they do in one sentence. And I always think that's an important thing to do when you want to invest. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, insurance, investment, I mean, it's not most, so much insurance anymore, but the investment portfolio that it's got, a bit exposed to some um, of the brick and mortar stores, but I think it's got so much cash. I think it's going to weather a lot of storms in the future. Uh, there you go. All right. Well, using Dario's uh, principle, perhaps legal general may not be the right one because it's <laughs> causing too much pain <laughs> yeah it was yeah uh all right anna or but anyone either yeah uh, oh. anna you go first oh, thank you <laughs> um so i think for me um gsk um i think pharmaceuticals generally are always going to be around and they've been around for donkey's years and i think i've got quite a few but for me they're probably the one i feel best about um National Grid, such it just feels like a very personally feels like a very safe investment. Um, we're always gonna gonna need them as well. And Johnson and Johnson, I mentioned them before, but they again have been around for hundreds of years. They are so diversified, both globally and in terms of the products, and they've weathered so many scandals. Okay, but. For me, it's uh, ASML, Dutch company. Oh, I want ASML. I want it so bad. I want it so bad. We've been talking about this earlier. I want ASML yeah. so bad. Basically, because they're kind of a monopolist. They uh, supply chip makers with all kinds of uh, things, like the hardware, the machines uh, that uh, produce the chips. And they're kind of uh, the only company that can provide a certain type of uh, machine. So basically, it's a monopolist. And that's what I like about ASML for the long term. Uh, also, Process, which is also a Dutch uh, company, um, it ha it's kind of an investment company, and they have more than a 30% stake in Tencent, the big uh, Chinese social media giant. And basically, if you buy Process, you can get Tencent at a discount uh, at this uh, very moment. So that's actually the reason I bought Process, and I get all the other investments they have uh, for free, basically. So. That's what I like for this year. I also like uh, the small cap I bought two weeks ago, uh, Vulcan Energy Resources, which is an Australian-based company, but they are planning to uh, produce uh, lithium in uh, Germany. And they are going to do this in a carbon uh, emission-free uh, way. So this will be uh, largely backed by the European Union. So that's why I believe that this company has very much room for growth, but then again, um, they will start producing in 2023. So that's kind of two years away from now. So there are some things that hurdles that they have to um, pass before uh, they start producing. So it's, it's still a lot, of, a lot of risk, but I like the narrative and the story about this company. So right. it's, a, it's, it's actually a very diverse uh, set of high conviction bets you guys have there. Uh, and, you know, Interestingly enough, no one has ever mentioned or even mentioned EV so far. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> well, the, the, the lithium miners. Yeah, it's indirectly. 
yeah, yeah, that's it. Lithium that's miners good. EV. What was the what was the company again? Uh, Vulcan Energy. Oh yeah, yeah, that's been yeah that has been mentioned. Yeah, they will provide German automakers with the lithium. Yeah, but by the way, ASML and um, Process absolutely brilliant stocks. I yeah. just can't buy them now because I feel like they're so. And we'll get probably get to that. Is the value of them right now is just incredible, isn't it? It's it's so up there. I, I yeah. find it hard to get anything at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, and um, well, speaking of the 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 EV, um, any anyone like like to have a strong opinion on that one, either like or dislike, or kind of in a in a so so middle middle ground, uh, just because it's a it's a very big uh, and tropical. Uh, area that everyone um, opines on these days. Everyone is expert on EV and batteries these days. So, like. <laughs> um, uh, go on, go on. Uh, uh, th- thanks, Paul. I, I was going to say, I think um, it, it's almost like it, people are attracted to it because because of the pandemic, and there's often a sort of a sense of rebuilding and rebirth after a pandemic. It's almost like the EV stocks are just now. It's like, how can we make the world better? Let's invest in EVs and. Some 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 things I think are justified. Other other things are not so much, and not specifically for for electric vehicles. I just think the sort of the renewables, um, clean energy, green energy sort of revolution in general. I mean, some things are just doesn't make sense to me in some ways. So like um, just a specific example, fuel cell energy um, is uh, very popular at the moment. Founded in 1969. Um, hasn't recorded an annual profit since, uh, since 1997 um, and effectively was nearly insolvent 19, 18, 19 months ago. Um, but it's got sort of, um, uh, at the last, t- last time I checked, a sort of um, 5 billion plus market cap and uh, revenue falling sort of 20% year on year. And it's almost like people are seeing what it can what can be achieved but not necessarily following the facts to then sense check what's going on and that's the only risk i think i see with it i think there's really positive intent behind it but is it is it backed up with facts at the moment and some some businesses i think are struggling and perhaps perhaps more than others yeah i'll happily back that one up um we plug a uh, you say plug and fuel cell fuel cell yeah specifically plug, yeah plug and fuel cell are two companies that are just issuing shares to make money at the minute um plugs a little bit better than fuel cell i think fuel cell is the norwegian one isn't it no it's not that's nell <laughs> um <laughs> but um <laughs> but they, they they're all issuing shares to make the money and they're not necessarily making effective profit and with the ev market right now no one can disagree that ev batteries vanadium reflux, all that sort of stuff that is coming. And by 2040, 2035, even maybe even faster than that, if you get exponential growth, the EV market is going to be massive and the revenues from them companies are going to be huge. But the stock market's just a bit early, I think. I think there's too many people just jump in a little bit too early. And I tell you what, I've just done a 30 minute video of it yesterday and uh, I'm not very kind. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the, the be all and end all of it is I think to the EV market, we're just a little bit early and a little bit too excited. And that might not be great in the future. Well, I've gone out on a limb there, haven't I? <laughs> yeah. what, what I think is that the traditional automaker companies uh, like Mercedes, Volkswagen, um, I think they would be able to buy uh, excellent electric cars too and people are all only buying tesla stock but in like f- five years I, I think that these companies will be able to um, provide people with fine electric cars too so i don't know why people don't buy the traditional uh, automated companies yeah i think that leads quite nicely into what i was going to say which is um I do think it's a great thing long term and it will be a huge thing with all the clean energy that's happening. Um, But I think for me, investing in individual companies is just a bit too risky. Um, So I actually hold an electric vehicle ETF, uh, which actually um, invests into companies like, I think, is it Ford and all these others that are actually working on electric vehicles? Don't ask me. I'm not into cars. I don't know anything about it. I just know they invest in like all these different holdings. Um, I remember looking at the list and it's got so many different car manufacturers. Um, I'm pretty sure Tesla is part of it, but 
it's not just putting all your eggs into Tesla, it's getting yeah. exposure to everyone who's making electric vehicles. That's very interesting. Um, okay, so just, just for full clarity, no one is actually holding any EV apart from the EV supply chain. No one's actually investing in EV uh, stocks themselves. No. Yeah. no direct holdings for me right now. No. Uh, I've got uh, Tesla and NEO, um, but they are very, very small. They're 50, one's $50, one's like 50 pounds. Right. Okay. And um, well, if we mention EV, we can't really ad ad avoid talking about ARC. Um, anyone has any particular view on uh, the various in, in innovation range funds that they, that they um, have? Um, do you invest in ARC, first of all? And if not, what, what you'd like to say to, uh, to, to those who like to gain exposure to the EVs and all the innovation trends through the ARC range funds? I've not looked enough into ARC yet. I've not had a chance, so I can't really express much opinion about ARC myself. Okay. So ARC Invest um, has, again, it has it right on the money. It, it, it's got the future in mind and it knows what's coming. Uh, and I, I just think, again, the stock market's a little bit too early to it and an excellent marketing, you know, an excellent marketing campaign going on. Has that just pushed things a little bit too far? That's, that's what it is in my opinion. Is the marketing the reason why everyone's gone for it? Or is it genuinely because the companies in there are that excellent? But on the other hand, if you go through ARC ETF, uh, ARC's ETFs, all of them, um, even in the genomics one, the genomics one, which is the most popular at the moment, um, even in there, there are some really good value companies. I think ARC Invest just recently started buying Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, that could be really big news for that company. Bristol Myers has got a ton of spare cash at the moment because of its sell gene. It's uh, yeah, sell gene deal went, went a bit sour. So it's got a ton of cash. And I think that's where ARK Invest is thinking as well. It's also got Novartis, um, it's Roche. There's loads of big solid companies in there and you don't necessarily have to take the risk with the tiny genomics companies in there. But on the other hand, you know, CRISPR is probably going to do amazing things in the future. Um, that's just my two cents on that. Okay. Yeah, for, for me, I look into the ARC ETFs, but um, mainly at the holdings. If you go to the website of ARC, you can uh, subscribe yourself for a mailing uh, list and you will receive mails uh, when they change uh, positions. So I did that like two months ago. So I get updates when they either buy or sell uh, stocks and they send it uh, daily. So over a period of time, I can, I can, I can look at uh, what they are buying and selling. And it's uh, yeah, relevant information for me, but I wouldn't buy the, e the uh, ETF. Interesting. Okay. Um, and the other question I'd like to get your opinion on is uh, anything that you have relating to fintech. Uh, it's just gaining more and more popularity. I know, Paul, you invested in, in JP Morgan as a way to, uh, to, to kind of gain exposure through an, a, a value in common bank who, who you wish to play more role in, in fintech. But any direct plays you guys have uh, in, into, into fintech space in your portfolio? Well, yeah, Jamie Dimon said the other day, he said it in, a, in the earnings report, it was, you should be scared. Should I swear? Well, I really want to swear. <laughs> <laughs> they should be scared shitless of um, all the, the fintechs like Square. PayPal, I really like. I think PayPal, personally, I think is better than Square. And I have 1% of my net worth in Bitcoin. I'm very vocal about that. I do love blockchain technology, uh, you know, particularly Bitcoin and Ethereum for what they are worth. Um, and, but that is really risky. Bitcoin and Ethereum, stupidly risky at the minute. You're going to spend a good few years in tremendous volatility like we've never seen before. For me, it's establishing which are the sort of main fintech players into the future. I mean, I saw I saw a news article the other day that said that some retailers are actually refusing cash because of the pandemic. And so from my perspective, that's an incredible environment for all of these fintech stocks to capitalize on if people physically can't pay with with old money. 
Um, so it's, it, but it's for me, I'm not too, um, I, I don't sort of follow the fintech side of things that closely. Um, it's something that I perhaps should look at a, a bit more in a bit more detail over the next couple of years, because I think there, there will be some big changes in this space. I recently invested in PayPal, actually. Um, and so far it's performing really well. And I think it was just before they announced that they were going to accept Bitcoin payments or let you pay with Bitcoin or something. And it's it's kind of shot up since. Um, but that's the only fintech I hold at the moment, um, plus Bitcoin and Ethereum as well. Um, but that's the only three I have. My only fintech company is uh, Agen. It's also a Dutch company, which... Uh, went public uh, last year and they are payment solution provider to big companies like uh, Uber, eBay, Microsoft, Spotify, LinkedIn, which is of course uh, a holding of Microsoft, LinkedIn, uh, KLM, um, Groupon, Etsy, all these uh, big companies are using the service of uh, Agen. So I think they also have uh, a lot of future potential. I don't know if you guys know the company. It's yeah, a Dutch yeah. company. Adyen's one of the big performers in our in the Discord and things. Ever, uh, lots of people love Adyen. Um, they also played has just split with Visa, so there might be a spat coming there on played. Played's the company that um, basically communicates with between the card processor and whatever app or whatever bank or um, is taking them on at the minute, and they're, they're the they're the people that fuse them together. <laughs> That's a terrible description of it. Uh, but yeah, played could be one that comes on pretty soon. I just don't know for sure how they make money yet. <laughs> Something we've got to work on. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the other question I have here is around currencies. Um, so it's, 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 it's good that uh, we were multinationals here. Uh, speaking of currencies, do you, um, if you invest in international stocks, do you invest in local currencies that you are based in? For example, if we're based in the UK, do you convert everything back to pounds? Or do you actually gain the currency exposure, such as you, you invest in US companies, you actually hold everything in, in dollars, if your broker allows you to do so? Uh, and, I, I, and I think a general point here is, what's your, if you have one, what's your outlook on pounds, euros versus um, dollars? Um, that's that's a that's a question coming up from the panel from the attendees. Yeah, so I'm an economics teacher, so I also teach about currencies. But what we've seen with uh, Trump is that he had some protectionist policies, um, which, of course, increased the value of the of the dollar. But I think Biden might be might uh, not be as protectionist as Trump. So I think that that might have some downwards pressure on the dollar uh, over the long term. And that's for me the reason that I started buying some uh, some European stocks. Yeah, that's, and, that's... and you hold everything in euros, by the way. I hold, yeah, no, I, I have a lot of um, US companies, but mainly because my salary is in euros and my savings account is in euros. So I wanted some diversification in terms of currencies. And that's why I started buying a lot of US companies when starting out. Yeah, the um, dollar's seriously devaluing at the moment um, in spite of said protectionist policies and Biden could possibly make it a little bit worse, which is scary to think because already the GBP is very strong against the dollar. And I think anyone who sees trading 212 as an example, that uh, that FX market is just always going down. It's killing mm-hmm. killing people's gains at the minute. Um, I hold the belief that long term that everything will even back out. I think US is a strong economy. You got to argue whether it's strong against China in the long term. But yeah, uh, at the moment, it's more of just a long term hedge and just hoping there's recovery uh, for me. Actually, hedging myself against currencies is very, very hard and probably a little bit out of my league, to be honest with you. Yes, it, I, I don't bother with that personally. I mean, currency risk is sort of part and parcel of, of being an international investor. That, that's the way I see it. It's something that I'm willing to tolerate just because I want exposure to these companies in different parts of the world. Um, I think is I'm pretty sure Digiro um, lets me hold in um, foreign currency, and um, uh, so 
anything in my Hargreaves account is all in GBP. Um, so uh, there's a bit of currency risk that I'm taking, but um, it isn't my whole portfolio. But I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with it, really. Um, like you said, Paul, I think over the long term, I, I, I don't think it's going to be that relevant personally. I'd rather not miss out on the investment opportunities because of it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And if you're going into companies that are that work all around the world, so let's say t- take some FTSE 100 companies, oil companies, Rio Tinto, one of my big favorites, big on copper at the minute. Uh, it's building its new mine in Brazil, I think. And that's going to be so open to all sorts of currency risk um, from from where it's selling its products to how it's just exchanging it back into uh, UK. So yeah, the economics pre- professor might be much better at this than I am. But yeah, it's, everything about that is just a little bit over my head, I think. I think companies tend to hedge against their own currency risks if they are multinational. Um, mm. I seem to vaguely remember that from my accounting. Um, but yeah, I, I don't do much sort of thinking about currencies. Um, I do hold in both GBP and USD. So two of the platforms that I use um, hold in US dollars. So you're only exposed to sort of the FX when you deposit and withdraw. Um, and then two of the others um, hold in pounds. Uh, and then I've got the S&P 500. Um, people always ask me on my portfolio updates whether uh, why I have two um, S&P 500 in ETFs. And it's because one's held in pounds, one's held in dollars. So between the two of them, they kind of offset each other a little bit on the FX. But that's the extent of my thinking about it. I don't, it, it's not something that I worry about very much and it doesn't stop me investing into a company if I want to. Okay. That's, that's very useful to know. Um, next question from the panel, just in the interest of time, I, I want to talk about the, the brokers you guys are using. Um, so first of all, are you using a mix of incumbent brokers? Uh, by incumbent, I mean those who still charge you a trading fee. Um, or are you all um, in your, uh, is all, all of your net worth in the new brokers, i.e. those who no longer charge a commission um, so that's that's the first question. And do you see that mix change going forward? I.e., do you, do you still, um, uh, if you are investing in incumbent brokers or through incumbent brokers, do you, are 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 you planning to change that going forward? That's the question. I invest in a mix. Um, I'm not looking to change it in the near future, but obviously minimizing costs of the long term is is one of the sort of the main things um, we should all be looking to do, I guess, as investors. So um, it's 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 nothing. I don't really want to. I don't want the disruption of of sort of moving large parts of my portfolio to to a different broker um, at this point in time because um, it's not. Uh, they're not the most outrageous fees. Um, it's more focusing on the individual. Um, investments and the ongoing charges associated with the funds um, that I think is going to have the greater uh, impact for me. But yeah, I do have a mixture at the moment. What are they, Dara? If you, uh, so if you... Hargreaves lands down and um, Digiro and Trading Two One Two. Okay. Um, I use. Go on, go on. <laughs> um, so I hundred uh, percent at the moment have everything in the zero commission platforms um, but I'm about to sign up to one that isn't just to test it out I feel like I want some exposure to the other platforms to learn about them how they work and be able to talk about them a bit more but at the moment um, all, all that I've invested is in the commission free platforms if you if you can can tell us what what brokers you're using Anna uh, yeah, so I've got um, four at the moment with three of them being my main ones. Um, one's more like I'm still trying it out. Uh, so trading two and two and free trades um, are the main two ones. Uh, I've taken a liking to eToro at the moment. Uh, so that's the third one. Um, and stake, which is the other US dollars one. Um, I'm still sort of learning uh, with that and, and haven't topped up much, but those are my four. Okay, cool. Uh, I am using uh, the hero. The Dutch uh, company and also uh, trading to one too. And most of my uh, money is in the hero right now, um, mainly because the uh, hero is a platform uh, with uh, a lot of stocks available. And I think that's a, the main shortcoming for me uh, to use trading to one too as my main broker because uh, oftentimes when I search stocks, I can't find them on uh, trading to one too, but I can find them on the uh, hero. So that's kind of the reason I use uh, the hero as my main uh, broker. And I also like it that it's, it's in the Dutch language. Mm-hmm. So that makes it more fun for me. Not, not using bucks. 
bugs. Yeah, I, I use bugs to zero, but um, also not a lot of stocks available uh, yet. And also the platform does not look as good as the Giro in terms of uh, all the information I can find, the graphs, etc. Okay, Paul? Commission-free apps have started to take over the world, haven't they? Um, that's what it is. I saw a great um, graph earlier. It showed the number of uptakes in the between the years of 1995 and 2000 of E-Trade, which was the brand new uh, fast internet marking broker during the year 2000. And it's exactly the same size graph as the Robinhood user uptake. Uh, is it? it <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's the, the parallels are incredible and that's scary to me. That's, that's really scary, but obviously investing is all about taking, uh, keeping your nerve. Um, <laughs> we, we, it might just be a sign of what's to come in the next five sort of years, maybe. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm jumped on, I've jumped on the bandwagon as well. I'm with trading two one two commission free. It's just making it so much easier to get into the stocks, the individual stocks. I also have, I mean, I'm on eToro for Bitcoin for that simple reason, because it's just got a much easier charting thing as I learn about charts or try to disprove charts is one of the things I'm trying to do. Um, and um, I have money in Hargreaves and Lansdowne as well. Um, and that's from, it's, again, that's a legacy thing like um, Dario. It's, um, it's more that I just had a stocks and shares officer in there and I probably shouldn't waste the tax benefit of it. So that's got a couple of funds in there. I think I've recently tra changed them over to FTSE 250 and Espo, uh, the gaming ETF is in there as well. Cause I think that's a big thing coming, but yeah, Hargreaves and Lansdowne, I'd never be buying stocks on Hargreaves Lansdowne. It's like 1199 per trade, uh, mm -hmm. not going near that one. They might've reduced that actually. Um, yeah. but the fees from some of the managed, uh, the managed fees on there, um, they're massive as well. So if you were to go with anything like Vanguard or Hargreaves Lansdowne, sticking with the standard index funds in there is what I'd probably do and what, what I'm planning on doing, to be honest. Okay. Well, we've got three minutes on the clock. Uh, final question. Wow. Uh, very open-ended here. If you have one thing to uh, either speak to yourself or speak to the audience about investing in 2021, what would that be? It can either be a reminder or something that you need to be aware of or something you need to be uh, betting your house on. Anything it can be. What, what would that um, one, one liner be uh, to either yourself or to anybody else you wish to impart on? That's not fair to bring it down to one line. Because <laughs> it is so, so complicated. How, about, how about we go with a few liners? I've got, I've got a one liner. I've got a one liner. I, th I think. Um, if you make mistakes, it doesn't define you. Just learn from it and next time try and do it a bit better. That's, I guess, the best advice I can give. Okay. Lots of commas in there. But... <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> any, I mean, any other things? For yeah. me, I'll, I'll literally go with Cathy Wood, what she said, because I do think Cathy Wood has got this, got 2021 down. I think she knows what's happening. She's like, it's like she's writing it. But she believes that cyclicals are coming back, cyclicals and value. She believes that there's there's going to be something in there. And she also, I think she specifically said, there's going to be a doozy of a correction. That's what she said. Uh, I don't know what measurement doozy is, but it's, it's you know, <laughs> it's coming apparently. Okay. Yeah, for me, it would be uh, only invest with money that you can afford to, to lose. So... That's what I'm doing, and that's why I'm not afraid to take any risks. Because even if the company would go bankrupt, I would still be able to uh, to pay off my mortgage and all the other kind of uh, things that I have to pay. So, in that sense, I'm, it makes investing also more fun to know that um, you're putting money at stake that you can afford to lose. And that's what kind of also fuels my hobby of investing in stocks and keeping track of the companies that I'm I'm in, uh, investing in. Okay. That's actually something I taught myself uh, almost 10 years ago, but I, I struggle to calculate how much money I can afford to do. <laughs> uh, Anna? 
Um, for me, it would be uh, don't panic sell. Um, I've seen this a few times uh, with people that I know where they'll believe in a company, they'll invest in it, and then they'll see it in the red for like a few weeks, and then they'll panic sell just because it's in the red. It's like, just don't look at it. <laughs> if you think it's a good investment, um, you know, unless something terrible has happened and you genuinely think like this company is going to go under, um, don't panic sell. Okay, right. Uh, okay, so that concludes the whole uh, panel discussion. Uh, a few admin points. Uh, we will post the recording after the event. We'll also share a few of these uh, quotations on our uh, social media channel. So do look out for them. Uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, Paul, Anna, Dario, and Bert uh, for joining us. Thank and, you. Uh, this, this kind of event will be, uh, ho will be hopefully ongoing for the rest of the year. Uh, so please watch out for the upcoming ones. Uh, so for now, uh, have a good night, everyone, and uh, enjoy enjoy watching the inauguration speech. I'll I'll catch up on that later. And see <laughs> if there's any funny thank one. you, everyone. Thank thank you. Guys. All right, thank you very much. Have a Bye. good day. Bye. Bye. -bye. Okay.